card shark is striking. It's near impossible to miss when scrolling through your digital storefront of choice, and I bought it on a whim based on its aesthetic alone. And that might be sufficient. For a measly Andrew Jackson, you can transport yourself back to a different place and time to see its sights, hear its music, and enjoy its historical fiction. What is Card Shark? That's kind of a difficult question to answer. You'll notice a distinct lack of card game tag if you try to isolate this game's genre, because despite your most popular viewing angles being of individuals sitting at a table with a deck of 52, the card games themselves are never actually the focus. Instead, your goal is cheating at those games, learning a bevy of tricks to guarantee a victory, and also gossiping with your opponents to advance the game's central mystery about royal affairs and conflicting claims to the throne. Specifically, the French throne. Our setting is mid-18th century France, and oh no, that can't be good. But it's okay because we're not playing from the crown's POV, and we've actually got a few decades before the guillotine's greatest hits anyway. Though the blade over France's aristocracy may not have metaphorically fallen just yet, we are still in an era of rising discontent. Discontent we witnessed through Eugene, a mute commoner who may have a bigger story to tell than his disability implies. He would have probably died serving in the same tavern for his whole life. But a call to adventure strikes. The tavern owner is murdered, forcing him out into the world at large and away from the only stability he's ever known, and into the arms of a card shark, the Comte. Seeing a use for a nobody who can stay quiet and perhaps more reasons undisclosed, the Comte takes Eugene under his fin and shows him how to cheat at cards. That's where we get into the gameplay and a whole list of real life card sharking verbs and tricks. In jogging, out jogging, and literal aces up your sleeve are but a few of the nearly 30 techniques that the game will go over. Each of those techniques is its own minigame, usually a collection of quick time events done in rapid succession without raising suspicion of the prey. That suspicion is visualized by a tension bar at the bottom that gauges whether or not your opponents are catching on. It's effectively just a fancy timer that will accelerate when a QTE isn't done successfully. Structurally, the game will have you traveling from location to location with the Compt. The road to each venue will give him time to explain the new trick he needs you to perform against the hosts. You execute that trick, get rewarded with more coin and more story, then repeat. With a few exceptions, this is the structure of the whole game, not just the tutorial act, and it's probably my biggest problem with it. Because Card Shark is so afraid of how different its gameplay is that it never wants to give you the driver's seat. In fact, the driver's seat practically doesn't exist. A more accurate title for this game would be The Card Shark's Assistant, executing on plans and tricks that someone else is deciding. There is a shocking lack of autonomy with nearly every trick. I can't help but feel like the game would have been way stronger if its list of 28 tricks was simplified into a much smaller list if that list had a unified control scheme that allowed for some more technical mastery. As it stands, the high quantity of deceitful techniques will have you jumping perspectives as dealer, player, observer, and servant so frequently that you'd never be able to make each fulfilling. So instead, Card Shark is a minigame collection. Deliberate shuffling, Marking cards, secret second decks, clever use of reflection, they're all minigames, and at almost every point I was yearning for something a bit less prescriptive and a bit more tactical. Because you don't get to pick which trick you think will deceive your opponent the best based on, I don't know, the venue, your spot at the table, maybe a character's personality trait, or even a predisposition to spotting certain tricks based on what you may have pulled on them the turn before. I think a game built around deceiving your opponents with card game tricks is such a good idea and I can't help but feel like there's a system missing here. The handful of times the game does let you pick which trick you want to use, it's really just a choice between which QTE do you want to perform. It has no other implications whatsoever, and effectively does not matter. So what we get instead is 28 different versions of Simon Says, where you pantomime along with the prompts until a successful outcome. Which isn't to say that the game is easy, sometimes those prompts demand memorization or multitasking, but they're just prompts nonetheless. It feels like we're stuck on this notch of the hero's journey for like 90% of the game, beholden to the whims of our mentor and stuck in an 8 hour long training montage. In the final act the reins feel like they've finally come off just a little bit, and the hilarity is that it's so starkly different from everything that came before, such a different way your brain needs to think, and such an untrained skill, that I felt woefully underprepared. Ironically I had to cheat to get past one part in particular, and I don't regret it for a second. Care to sit out this game of strategy and continue the story? 
That's a prompt you'll be met with after you fail enough QTEs in a row. And though I avoided its use early on, the closer I got to the game's credits, the more I fell in love with seeing it. The suggestion that it's strategy that we're skipping may be a mockery, but it was a surefire way to refocus my time on the aspects of the game that I found most enjoyable. I can't tell if that's a good thing or not. As much as I appreciate its inclusion, I think it's the necessity of its inclusion that might be a bit more questionable. If I'm dedicating an entire paragraph of my review to how much I like to skip playing the video game button, that's probably not a good sign. There's some oddities outside of the moment-to-moment -moment card sharking too though. The only purpose of the coins you procure from your targets is to enable higher stakes games against higher stakes targets. There is a donation box that has some minor story implications, but I can't help but feel like we're missing another system in here somewhere to use these coins in interesting ways. For a game and a setting that has wealth so ingrained into its essence, it doesn't feel like it does a whole lot when you're playing it. Plus, you'll have the odd scenario where someone will gladly welcome you back to the table right after they busted you for cheating and sent you to prison. There might be a level of narrative dynamism missing here. But what's not missing is style. Sure, Card Shark might just be a game of Simon Says, but it is the prettiest game of Simon Says ever. I think outside of folks who may have a predisposition to enjoying cheats and magic tricks, the real reason to play Card Shark is for its historical fiction murder mystery and the sights and sounds you get while uncovering it. As we progress through France and even some of its neighbors, we learn more about a missing and presumed dead royal bastard that is driving the comps to cheat, using money and ill-gained wins as leverage to blackmail increasingly more important people. It ends up being a relatively compelling story if not a completely fleshed out one. After all, it's about rigging games of chance where the most desirable outcome is almost always the faces of nobility. I know that may be a fun juxtaposition against pre-revolution France, that's all it ever is. It hints at themes of great relevance to France's upcoming revolution and the corresponding societal change without really exploring it enough, or our characters' motives for being involved in it. If more of our heroes' thoughts on the world and the changes around them were sprinkled throughout the game instead of being backloaded into the final act, it would have given a heightened importance to every step along the way. It would have probably also made that final act a lot better too, with its ultimate stakes final game having you choose between high-minded ideals instead of just going along for the ride. But there are plenty of fun twists and turns, and when it's hitting the right beats, it's certainly hitting them. Really, it's the treats that your eyes and ears are witness to that make this package worth it. Card Shark looks like it could have been painted in the era it's inspired by, and its music sounds like it could have originated on instruments and styles from centuries past. Actually, that's because they kind of were. The soundtrack is mostly new arrangements of music from or around that period anyway, giving some authenticity to the vibe. That vibe is crucial, and I think that's why I kind of like Card Shark, even if such a large chunk of my hours with it felt like a slog. Recommending it feels like the deck is stacked against me, but despite missed opportunity and boring gameplay, Card Shark succeeds for me because it isn't just a game, it's a place. It completely nails a unique aesthetic, if not its unconventional gameplay. I may have never felt like a Card Shark, but I absolutely felt like I was in 18th century France and if the ability to capture your imagination and transport you to new places isn't one of the highest goals a game can achieve, then I don't know what is. I do certainly feel weird recommending a game that I very transparently didn't enjoy playing. In a way, that feels like cheating, but maybe for Card Shark, that's okay. <laughs>